I'm sorry guys, I do not know how to do an alert sound with my mouth. Anyways, this is Ashley. I'm putting out a disclaimer to let you know to not take the info in this video or any other video that I've ever done or ever will do as fact. This is a scandal gossip tea video and everything reported may not be true. Honey, I just had to put that out there because woo, chai. You go for me and I'm taboo. Prune puss, you make sounds I don't like. But if you're hard to get, I go for you. You do that and I'll scratch out the one good eye you got left. But if I do, then you are through, boy. My baby, that's the end of you. You wasting time right now, Sergeant. The wind's blowing me in another direction. It ain't no use arguing with the wind. So take your cue, boy. Don't say I didn't tell you the truth. You just keep a light burning in the window, boy. I told you truly. If I love you, that's the end of you. Hello, hello, hello. This is Ashley with Ashley Says So. And y'all know I had to do an intro on my girl. Dorothy Dandridge is my fave. Isn't she just a doll? I love her. Let me go ahead and get this out of the way. Please tune in at the end of the video. We're going to do a vote on who we want to see next. Because um, I have a list. Yeah, I'm not finna lie to y'all. I'm gonna just be honest with y'all. Uh, my list has gotten confusing. I'm not gonna lie. I think I mixed some of the names up. You know, it just got too long because the comments have been coming and I appreciate that. But with doing everything, it kind of got lost in the sauce. So now I'm gonna take names off that list, about two names a video, and I'm gonna put those names up and you guys need to vote and tell me who I should do next. All right, go ahead and subscribe, like, share, comment, do whatever you need to do because you know you're gonna like this. Hunty. And most of Dorothy's tea has been spilled already. So no, there's probably not going to be anything in here that just whoa, blows your mind. But I had to cover her. And yes, she was on the list. Dorothy Jean Dandridge was born November 9th, 1922 in Cleveland, Ohio. She was the second daughter born to Miss Ruby Dandridge, who was an entertainer. And Mr. Cyril Dandridge, who was a cabinet maker and a Baptist preacher. She has a sister that was one year older than her, and her name was Vivian. Now, Dorothy was not born to her parents being together as a couple. Ruby actually left Cyril while she was pregnant. I don't know how long it took them to know that their personalities didn't mesh, but honey, it did not mesh. Cyril was more laid back, you know, he was comfortable, he was good. As long as he could make ends meet and take care of his family, he was good. Ruby, on the other hand, no, no ma'am. She wanted to get out there and be an entertainer. She wanted to make as much money as she could make. It was just talent and entertainment just running through her blood. And she just could not stand the home life. So she picked up to pursue her dreams and she started to pursue them through her children. As soon as Dorothy and Vivian, they're about two and three years old, Ruby turns them into a group called the Wonder Children. And they're touring all over the states, mostly in the South. They're touring on the Chitlin circuit, doing vaudeville, and they're mostly performing at churches, doing stage plays, things like that. And somewhere along the line, Ruby met a friend named Geneva Williams. Now, Geneva was that close friend that would provide all of Ruby's needs, help her with the children, things like that when she was struggling. And that friendship actually turned into them being lovers. And after they became lovers, she let Geneva be the manager to the Wonder Children. And the children called her auntie. But I know the kids was confused, though. They had to be because auntie beating on us. And that's what Geneva was doing. She would use her managing them as an excuse to hit on them and pinch them and beat them. She would make them pretty much dance, sing until they just about passed out. And if they missed a step, Joe Jackson was coming out. That's just the way it was. So the children were finding success on the circuit, but then the Great Depression hit. And honey, wasn't nobody making no money. So them and other entertainers around that time had to find other things to do. Like, ain't nobody finna pay no money and they don't have no money. The last thing they want to see is somebody go sing and dance and do a song. I know nobody care about that when they broke. So the Great Depression has hit and they're residing in New York at this time and they're just barely scraping by, you know, doing whatever they have to do. And that fire starts burning in Ruby again. The flames all over her, honey. 
So she takes off for California. She's like, let me go see what I can do out here to see if there's any work. And she goes and she actually becomes a success on film and radio. Now, granted, she was not getting A-list roles or anything like that. Of course, she was playing maids and supporting characters, but she was making enough money where she could take care of her family. She called Geneva and she said, bring my girls to me. Let's go and get this show on the road. So Geneva moved with the girls and they enrolled the girls in a school for the first time in their life they were in a school. They're probably around 10, 11, 12 around this time. They've never been schooled before because they were busy entertaining. While at school, Dorothy and Vivian run into a classmate who likes to sing, dance, and play as well. Her name is Etta Jones. So they ask her, would you like to join our group? There can be three of us. And she says, well, yes. And so they changed their name from the Wonder Children to the Dandridge Sisters because they're getting a little older, you know, they ain't kids no more. Mm. As the Dandridge Sisters, they start performing everywhere. They're starting to perform at clubs, um, the Apollo Theater, the Cotton Club, other renowned clubs because their name is getting out there. Three beautiful girls that can sing, put on a good show, and they're bringing in a little bit of money. But of course, at these shows, there's not only them, there are males there. There are males in the audience, there are male promoters, managers, there are male other entertainers. Let me tell you something that happened. Here's a little bit of tea, honey. So apparently the Dandridge sisters were performing one night and Bilbo Jangles Robinson was there on the bill. And so he's sitting down somewhere and Dorothy comes and sits on his lap. Now, she's not really doing it in a flirtatious way, I don't think. And she's also doing it for a photo op. You know, there's people taking pictures all around. But they said that Mr. Bilbo Jangles whispered in her ear and he told her to watch out for the wolves. And then he added, like me. Well, at least, honey, I guess he was honest. He was letting her know that, hey, uh, watch out for me because, baby, I won't mean you no good. I bet a little tail got up out of his lap then. The men were definitely out and so the girls of course notice this they're getting older so they're like mm. and the men looking at them like Ooh. and then Geneva looking at all of them like oh uh. now Geneva could not make it to every single show so she was not there all the time and she used this as an excuse to start sexually abusing the girls um let's say they had a show you know Geneva knows the men are there the girls are there she can't be there that night well, when the girls get home, she starts to do things like, let me check to see if you're still a virgin. So she starts to basically insert her fingers into them to check to see if their hymen is intact. I'm sorry, but it's not your responsibility to basically molest someone to see if they're still a virgin. That ain't, that ain't none of your business. I mean, you can ask and that can be enough from there. But you shouldn't ever forcibly put your fingers inside of anyone. That's ridiculous and disgusting. Some people think Ruby knew about it, then others think she didn't. I don't know. I'm conflicted on that one. I don't know. Time, though, goes on, and the girls start to develop these figures. What Geneva does is she makes them start taping their breasts down. You know, they got to tape their butt in, their butt and hips. You know, they walking around like Urkel or something like that because she doesn't want them to develop. To me, it's a little bit perverted that you want to keep them as children, but you also want to molest them. So, you know, what's really going on? I don't know. And they were trooping through it, true soldiers in my book, because they were going through all that at home, but yet and still they would go every night and they would go and perform. Well, it was at one of these performances, the Nicholas brothers were also there putting on a great show. You know, they were big time celebrities at this time. And it was actually before a Nicholas brother performance that the Dandridge sisters were on stage. They were doing their little thing and, you know, lifting their little dresses up to show their legs, you know. And so Harold and Fayard Nicholas were looking from the curtains on the side, you know. Ooh, look at those girls. Ooh, that's fine mama. I don't know if they said that, but that's what I imagine they said. So after the show, Harold and Fayard tried to talk to Dorothy. You know, they're all flirting, um, telling her she looks so pretty. And I'm sure Dorothy is like, <laughs> boys, boys, you know, something like that. That's how I would have been. But it was actually Harold who won her hand to date, of course. But it was Harold and he was the younger brother. And it's very rare that the younger brother will beat out the older brother for a girl. 
but Harold was the winner. So he and Dorothy started to date and um, going everywhere together dancing. And of course it took some convincing from Ruby to Geneva to let Dorothy date. I mean, she needs to start looking for a husband. She needs to get out there and experience the world. And Geneva, of course, wanted to keep her home for selfish reasons. We all know that. Also, Dorothy got emboldened from dating Harold. But when Geneva got up to her old tricks again and started trying to check, Dorothy fought her off. She did not let her do it and she pushed Geneva to the ground and she let her know that that's gonna be the last time you touch me. And she was right because shortly afterwards, Harold proposed and they were married on September 6, 1942. And they had a pretty Hollywood ceremony and there were actual stars there. They settled down in what Dorothy thought was going to be wedded bliss. And of course, it turned out not to be. Harold was a big time womanizer. He was a playboy, a sporting man. Now, Dorothy was sort of a, I wouldn't call her a pushover, but she was a woman that took his infidelities and felt like they were her fault. She felt like there was something that she was missing, that she wasn't sexual enough, that she wasn't doing enough to fulfill their marriage, and that's why he was seeking elsewhere. You know, and of course, that's a bunch of BS, but that's what she thought. Now, let me put in a little scandal here. I don't know how true it is. I really don't. But I do remember seeing a very, very, very old interview. And it was a, it was an actress. She was not a big time actress. She was a two bit player. She was an actress back in this day. And this interview was like from the nineties and the internet had probably first came out. There was definitely no YouTube yet. I know that for sure. But um, anyway, this lady who was an old time actress back then, she said that her along with other girls who were bit part players, they had actually attended a party and she said Dorothy was amongst them. The interviewer was naming a lot of different people. And she was like, yeah, she was there. Yeah, she was there. And it was a big deal because she was the only black girl there. This is when Dorothy is about 16, 17, okay? Supposedly, and the big studio bosses came in and they were basically taking the girls by the hands and taking them out to the parking lot to having their way with these girls. And the lady did say that none of it was forced. You know, they were doing this because they wanted to get ahead. I don't know if this is true. Matter of fact, oh, I have searched up and down for this video, but I cannot remember that woman's name because like I said, she was not a big time actress. She had, she did make it big time. And I remember it was just like some kind of interview, just uh, impromptu. I think somebody found out that she was in the pictures a long time ago. They stopped by her house, did an interview. It, she was elderly and she was telling, I mean, she, she just was telling it like it was. I don't know if I really believe this story anyway, but I just wanted to insert a little bit of scandalous tea that I have seen before. And I saw this with my own eyes. Let's get back to the story. So Dorothy blames herself because Harold, you know, she, I guess she says she's not sexual enough, which maybe means that story is not true. And in an attempt to kind of curve Harold's behavior, she becomes pregnant. Now, if she did think that this was gonna stop his behavior, she was dead wrong. Harold ain't stopped nothing, honey. Harold was still out there doing the most as much as he wanted to. As a matter of fact, during that whole pregnancy, he would basically leave her to go do what he wanted to do. He was still doing that by the time that she hit nine months. Let me tell you the tea on that. Wait, she's nine months pregnant. They wake up one morning, she's having stomach pains. And she tells him, I'm having stomach pains. And he's like, well, I want to go golf today. You know, you've been having stomach pains pretty much this whole pregnancy, but look, ain't no baby here. And she's like, I know, Harold, I don't think that you should leave me here to go golfing. So he was like, you know what? Uh, that's fine. I'm going to take you over to Fayard's house so you can sit with Jerry, which was Fayard Nicholas's new wife, Jerry Branton, at that time, Jerry Nicholas. He takes her over to Jerry's house and he leaves. He's like, okay, y'all are settled. Good. I'm about to go golfing. I'm not sure if Harold went golfing. They're there, they're talking. All of a sudden, Dorothy actually goes into labor. She starts having contractions. So Jerry is like, we need to get you to the hospital pronto. But they had no car. Of course, when Harold left, he took the car. So they call up the golf club that he's supposedly at. And of course, he's not there. Now nobody know where Harold is. So, you know, maybe he did come there for a little while, but his tail show ain't there no more. And hours have passed. He lied. He said he was going to be right back. He ain't been right back. Jerry wants to call the hospital. She wants to make arrangements. And Dorothy is like, no, the father should be around for the birth of their child. So she did try to hold the baby. She could not hold it anymore, though, because the baby actually started coming. So Jerry's like, screw this. I'm about to go find a way for us to get to the hospital. 
She starts running around the neighborhood, knocking on people's doors. Now, Jerry said that this process took about a full hour before they got somebody to take them. They arrived to the hospital. Dorothy has the baby, and this baby is known as Harolyn Suzanne Nicholas. And the date is... September 2nd, 1943. Harold finally makes it to the hospital. He sees the baby. I'm sure Dorothy is giving him all kind of attitude because I know I would. They're very ecstatic. They take their baby home and they start to live life of parents. Well, Dorothy did. Harold was still out doing whatever he wanted to do. But Dorothy wasn't really worried about that. She had her baby. You know, that's all she needed was her child. That completed her. Now here comes trouble. As the years started passing by, Dorothy and Harold started to notice that something was not quite right with Harolyn. She would just stare at the wall for hours at a time. She would not acknowledge either of them, even if they were talking right in front of her face. She used to just have like body movements. Sometimes she would grunt, things like that. Um, so Dorothy started taking the child to all type of specialists. Harold, he checked out. He just, he figured like something ain't right with this child. He checked out. I've even read sources where Harold accused Dorothy of messing around with somebody else because supposedly he claimed that his bloodline don't make babies like that. Excuse me, sir. Child, let me beg back. Dorothy's taking this child to see all type of specialists, uh, you know, trying to fix her child. And a lot of people took her money because they promised that they would give her different exercises, give her different foods to eat, you know, anything to fix this child. Lies, pretty much. Finally, she ran to somebody who told her the truth, the horrible truth, that Harolyn was actually mentally retarded, as they called it back in that day. Once Dorothy relayed this information to Harold, he, he just totally did not have anything else to do with that chat. But Dorothy continued taking Harolyn to different type of specialists who again took her money from her. And Harold at this time, now he's taking these long tours over in Europe, just over there living like a single man, acting like he don't have a wife and child at home. And he found out that he liked life that way. He missed being a bachelor. He regretted being married. He, he didn't want a wife and child anymore. And he actually wrote Dorothy a letter and he told her, this is the life that I want, you know? So this marriage is pretty much over. I don't know if he said those exact words, but that's pretty much the way he took it. And so Dorothy did not hesitate. She ended up being like, okay, you know what? You haven't said anything about a divorce though. You're sitting up there talking about the marriage is over and you want to live that way, but you ain't said nothing about a divorce. So she actually asked for a divorce and Harold granted that divorce. Out of all of the men she married, Harold Nicholas was the love of her life. So that hurt her tremendously to lose her family that way. But she pressed on and she tried to take care of Harolyn the best way she knew how. But she had no money. Harold wasn't sending her any money. As a matter of fact, he stopped sending money while they were still married. Like on that last trip to Europe, he had stopped sending money like months before. Dorothy had been fending for herself. And now she was big time by herself. So she had to leave her daughter in the care of caretakers because she had to make money but she had to start from the bottom up. When she quit show business, I mean, she was just now breaking into it. So any little thing that she did, those little bitty appearances, don't nobody remember that? I mean, you know, that's just like a commercial today. You see the Colgate commercial. You don't remember that person that's in that Colgate commercial? None do you. No, you do not. So that was the equivalent of her career at that time. So now she's starting over from the bottom and she had to do what she had to do. So she contacts a guy named Phil Moore. He helped her in the club scene. She remembered him. He was a song arranger. He was a jazz piano player, you know, so she knew he had the contacts and she knew that he can help her. And he did sort of, but he was one of those people that tell you they'll get you a job. But then when you call and ask him about it, they act like you're getting on their nerves and you sitting up there looking stupid. He was one of those type of people. So Dorothy realized that times had changed and she also realized that she was a woman now and she knew how to do what she had to do. So she started sleeping with Fillmore. She did, let's just be honest. She started sleeping with him and once she gave him that and became the woman on his arm, he started putting everything into her. So he revamps her image. He takes her out of that dandridge sister type stuff, those little kitty hairstyles, and he makes her very sultry. And now she's a smoldering, 
club singer. She starts to book engagements at little nightclubs, you know, and she's doing her thing. And I want to let you know that Phil Moore at this time was not the only man that she was sleeping with. She was dating a lot of men. Most of them weren't known, but as long as they had the money, see what I'm saying? She had refined her bedroom skills. The girl came a freak in the bedroom. Let's just put it what it is. She became a big freak in the bedroom. She knew how to please these men and she knew how to get inside of their wallets. And she gets cast in a movie called Tarzan's Peril. And in that movie, she plays a jungle queen named Queen Mel Mindy. Not a big role, but she's just giddy that she's in a movie. And she thought that after this role that many more movie roles would be coming. So she actually stopped her singing career. She was not performing in any more clubs. In that transition, she met a guy named Earl Mills. And to me, he was our guardian angel and he also became her manager. And he told her, uh, you need to get back out there and start doing club shows. And she's like, no, like I'm an actress now. <laughs> Haven't you heard? And he's like, girl, get back out there and do the club shows. You ain't, ain't nobody ask you to be in nothing. You need to go out there and make some money. And that's what she did. She got out there, she performed, became a huge success, a smash hit because Earl Mills worked tirelessly to get her name out there. She was in the newspapers. They were calling her sepia princess, the most beautiful Negro woman in the world. You know, she was getting a bunch of clout and fanfare. And finally, something magical happened. She was cast in a movie called Bright Road with Harry Belafonte. Movie didn't do so well, but Dorothy was a lead actress in the movie. Now, another scandal. It's also rumored that she hooked up with Harry Belafonte and they had a small relationship and that she wanted it to go further, but Harry Belafonte pretty much broke her heart. She felt like he kind of just used her to get what he wanted to get and then he went on dating whoever else he was dating and went on about his way. I also want to add that this is around the time that sources reportedly say that Dorothy started to get disillusioned with black men. Harold Nicholas broke her heart. Phil Moore wouldn't really help her unless she put out. Harry Belafonte broke her heart and there's no telling who else, you know. So they said around this point, this is when she strictly started dating white men from here on out. But someone else said that when Dorothy was asked, why don't you find you a nice black husband? That she said that there are no available successful black men here in Hollywood. So, you know, who knows? Started to date actor Peter Lawford. Um, they were very much in love with each other. And Peter actually wanted to marry her. But he was told, if you marry that little girl, Boy, you ain't finna do nothing. We finna ruin you. You're not about to get no more movies. Talking about you a comedian. You ain't that funny to sit up there and think you can marry a little Negro girl and get away with it. No, sir. Sorry, no. And they also told him that th they were gonna ruin her career. If y'all wanna get married, go ahead and take y'all little stuff and go live in that van down by the river. So him knowing this, he called everything off with Dorothy. You know, but he did explain to her, your star is just now starting to shine. See how far your career takes you. Don't mess it up with this thing with me and us. While this is happening, a movie comes along called Carmen Jones. Oh my gosh, black actors and actresses go crazy all over the world. This is something they've been waiting on because this movie has an all black cast. But the work Earl Mills had put in for Dorothy Dandridge had helped her out tremendously. Her face was everywhere. And that is what afforded her an audition with Otto Preminger. She walks in there. And she's, even though we know that she's learned how to be a freak in the bedroom, she's not about to show that. You know, she walks in there as a prim, proper lady and she starts to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Dorothy Dandridge and I'm going to audition for the role of Carmen Jones. And Chani, before she can get the sentence out of her mouth, Otto Preminger told her, you're, no, no ma'am, I'll give you the role of Cindy Lou, but you're not Carmen. You're too upright. You're too uptight. You know, you don't scream sexiness to me. You scream business casual. You done walked in here with your little business skirt suit on and girl, get out of my face talking about you, Carmen Jones. She was Cindy Lou, which was the girl that got dumped for Carmen. So, you know, Dorothy wasn't having this. Like, no, baby, you trying to play me. Don't do me. Don't do me, sir. You don't play me and sit up there and act like I'm going to get dumped for somebody. Are you crazy? And that was one time where being a lady in these streets didn't get you nowhere. It is true that her mother and her sister and Earl Mills and everybody else that was around her did pressure her to go back and get that role, read Carmen, become Carmen. But Dorothy knew something that was going to be even better than that. She sashays in his office, you know, looking good, smelling good, talking a good game. And by the end of the night, 
her and Mr. Primager are in bed. At least that's what the gossip says. But again, in her defense, when she came in there, she tried to do the professional, you know, regular audition. And when he dismissed her without even hearing her out, that let her know that, okay, that's not going to fly. These are like some monsters out here and I got to be a monster too. And she knew lifting up her skirt would actually work. At least she wasn't like Barbara Payton. From what I heard, Barbara Payton actually went into an audition, just lifted her skirt like, look, I know what it takes to get the role. Let me lift up my skirt. You want to use this couch right here? Come on, daddy. Let's get it going because I need this role. She booked the role of Corman Jones. The movie was a smash hit. Afterwards, Dorothy is definitely enjoying the spotlight. Um, she got so many accolades. As a matter of fact, she did such a great job. She was nominated for the 1955 Oscars. No, she did not win. Grace Kelly won. I feel like it was a ripoff. But she got nominated, the first African-American actress to do so. But she made a mistake that I'm sure would haunt her for the rest of her life. She took the relationship she had with Otto Preminger too serious. She got caught up in it and she fell in love. And to her defense, Otto made it easy for her to fall in love because he was telling her that he loved her. You know, also footing all the bills, buying her a new house, buying her a new car, buying her furs. You see some of the pictures I'm putting up? Like, she was living that life. She was a pampered, kept woman at that time, and he made sure his lady was looking good. Also, she could be seen out in public with him sometimes. It would be listed under the circumstances of a director and actress, but, you know, it felt good to be on his arm. There was only one problem. He would not leave his wife. And Dorothy was very hurt and upset by that because Otto's wife was out there dating other men, being seen with other men, sneaking out with other men. She didn't even care if the paparazzi called her with her legs around another man. She didn't care. So Dorothy felt like, well, why won't you leave her? She was so in love that when he started giving her bad career advice, she took it. She was going to be cast as Tuptum, a slave girl in The King and I. And Otto got in her ear and told her, no, no way. You've been nominated for an Oscar. You are a lead actress. I wish you would sit up there and play a supporting role that's a slave girl. But Dorothy had already agreed to do the film. She had signed a contract with 20th Century Fox for $75,000. And they expected her to do the movies that they threw her way. If not, she was going to be cast as basically a difficult actress. And Earl Mills got in her tail. He's like, you know, I worked hard to do this. We got you a contract. What are you doing? You're ruining yourself. And she's like, well, Otto said that I shouldn't be doing that. And Earl was like, baby, I don't care what Otto said. He must not know what's good for you. And he must not care about you because he's sitting up there, got you turning down these roles, acting like you too good. You are Negro, sweetheart. This is the 50s. What are you doing? You don't turn down anything that can help your career. Dorothy turned up her nose and she said, Otto said. The King and I turned out to be a smash hit. I mean, it was big time, even bigger than Corman. And Dorothy was very sad, very angry, couldn't believe it. Like, what did I do? And when she went to Otto Preminger for comfort, the narcissistic man he is, he didn't take no blame. He told her, well, look, you made that choice. Like, did nobody tell you to do that? Why did you do that? And as a matter of fact, if you're going to snivel and cry when stuff don't go your way, then you shouldn't be out here at all. You're not built for this industry. As time went on, Dorothy became pregnant with Otto's child. Um, she was excited about it, but Otto, as well as the studios, told her to get rid of it. And this really hurt her because if the studios had told her that, Dorothy didn't care. She wasn't going to do what the studio said if Otto would have been happy about it. But Otto was not happy about it. He basically told her, you definitely ain't finna ruin me. Me? Having a baby by a little black actress? I'm sure he didn't say that, but that's what he thought. And Dorothy also put those pieces together because she found out that he had gotten another entertainer pregnant, a burlesque dancer by the name of Gypsy Rose Lee. And he had a son by her. Now, granted, the world didn't know about this. You know, he distanced himself, but he at least allowed her to have the baby. You see the difference in that? Dorothy, he wouldn't even allow her to have the baby. And so she started acting like a scorned woman. Every time they get together now, she's fussing. I can't believe you sitting up there treating me like this, but you treated them like this. Tell the truth, Otto. Do you really love me? Do you? She's becoming a headache to Otto Preminger. So he starts to slowly push her away, slowly distance himself. I don't necessarily think he actually broke it off. It just sort of broke off. You know, she may have even ended it. You know how stuff just kind of fade away. But 
I heard he was still very jealous when he saw her with other men. Because after this, Dorothy had a few more movies. There was Tamango, there was The Dex Ran Red, there was Island in the Sun. A little scandal here. It is said that Dorothy slept with every leading man that she was with in those movies. And she was humiliated because she had to return to the club scene. Joan Crawford been around for 20 years. You know, Grace Kelly, all these other people, their stars are still blooming. They revamp themselves and they continue to being in the spotlight. Dorothy could not do that because for one, she was Negro. And then for two, she was labeled as difficult. Finally, a light came shining in again. And there was an all black casting call for the movie Porgy and Bess. And Dorothy doesn't even have to audition. She is back. She comes in, gets on set, and finds out that the director is none other than Otto Preminger. They already have bad history. Um, and when she comes in there, she's probably apprehensive. She don't know what it's going to be. Baby, when I tell you, he treated her like she was scum, like she was a bad actress, calling her dumb, stupid. And people like Sidney Poitier, they witnessed this. But he said that they were told as long as he doesn't put his hands on her, that there's nothing that they could do. Now, let me insert a little bit of scandal in here, honey. Now, this part kind of made me look at Dorothy kind of different. The actor Brock Peters played the character named Crown on the movie Porgy and Bess. The character named Crown rapes Dorothy's character, whose name is Bess. So it is said that one day after filming, Dorothy gets home and calls Otto on the phone. And the conversation supposedly goes like this. Otto, you got to replace Brock. I just want that man out of there. You know, when he puts his hands on me, I can't stand it. I just, I just, I just get so worked up when he touches me. And then he's just so... He's so, he's so black. Excuse me? What color you think you is? You black too. Last time I checked, both of your parents was black. You might got some little mix on down the line somewhere, but baby, you consider black. When they talked to you, you was Negro, a Negro actress. So what you talking about? Let me roll it back in because I don't know if that's true. Some people said it wasn't true at all. And then some people said that she didn't say that, but Otto Preminger called Brock Peters and told him that Dorothy said that because he wanted more rage to go into the rape scene. I can believe it if he said it because he was a nasty person. So Porgy and Bess pays the bills for a little while, but of course Dorothy goes back where? To the good old club scene. She is still dating but not dating seriously. That is until she performs at a hotel and a guy named Jack Dennison, who was the owner of that hotel, woos her. I own this hotel. I can take care of you. I can give you what you need, that type of thing. So she marries him. Now, I don't know why she's not getting that white men don't have all the answers, just like black men don't have all the answers. She got that pretty quick, but it's hard for her to believe this about white men for whatever the case. I don't know. Could have just been the times that she's living in. Child. Once again, like I always say, that man started busting that girl all upside the head, honey. He ain't had no money. He's stealing from her. He making her pay his bills. He knocking her out, ran her career to the ground. And Dorothy was like, okay, I got some money tucked away in investments. Thank God for that money. He can't touch that money. Child, whoever the investment was, it was a scam, child. Stole all that woman money. So eventually, Dorothy cannot take it anymore. She's drinking a lot. That Jack Dennison is drinking a lot. She divorces him in 1962. After this, again, sad, depressed, drinking this time, doing her antidepressants and possibly doing other drugs to make herself feel good, but you ain't heard that from me. And then 1963 hit. She has to file for bankruptcy. And here's a picture here with her looking very sad. Because not even nine years ago, she was on top of the world with Corman Jones. And here you are, filing bankruptcy. She cannot keep up the care for her daughter, Harolyn. So she had to let her daughter be a ward of the state. Her daughter had to go to a state mental hospital. And that's where her daughter, Harolyn, stayed until the day she died. Which my sources say, April 14th, 2003... Carolyn was 60 years old and she passed away there. They said that no family even claimed her body. A lot of people said that when Dorothy hit it big with Carmen Jones, her mother and her sister kind of turned their backs on her. They were jealous. So that could attest to that. That's probably why her daughter didn't have anybody in the family to claim her body or nobody to visit her after her mother had passed away. For the rest of the year in 1963, Dorothy... She's drinking away her pain. She's letting herself gain weight. She's not fixing up anymore. She's not doing anything. She has moved into a little small apartment. She was used to living in the high class neighborhood. 
So now that she has come down to the lower class neighborhood, she felt like everybody was eyeing her things. Everybody wanted what she had. So they said she was calling the apartment office like every other week, accusing people around her of stealing things out of her apartment. But girl, ain't nobody thinking about you. These folks ain't caring about you. Ma'am, you're living just like we're living. You may have been a big time star one time before, but don't nobody want them uh them coats and stuff. Don't nobody want that stuff no more. Like, girl, go on. You living right here with us. So yeah, like, no ma'am. 1964 rolls around. She gets a call from a club that she used to perform in Vegas. They're saying, Dorothy, where are you? We've been looking for you. And she's like, what? Looking for me? Dorothy, what? why have you not been back here to perform? We need you. We want you. Crowds love you. So this lifts her spirits. And she does. She does go and perform. She likes it. And so she starts performing, you know, in different places here and there. Nothing big like she used to, but definitely started getting herself back together, you know, started posing for photos again, just doing things like the old Dorothy Dandridge. 1965 hits and... Earl Mills has booked her a three-picture deal in Mexico. Dorothy is ecstatic. Earl is ecstatic. Everybody's ecstatic. You know, she's getting back out there. No, she's not the young whippersnapper she used to be. Her face might not look exactly the same, but she's still Dorothy Dandridge, and she can still carry a picture. Hmm. And also, she was about to do an engagement in New York. The night before she left for New York, she was on the phone with her ex-sister-in-law, Jerry Brandt, all night long. This was portrayed in the movie. Jerry says this was true. The next day, Earl Mills comes to pick her up to take her to the airport. There's no answer. Nobody comes to the door. So he calls her. He's knocking on the door. There's no answer. So finally, he barges in the door and he finds Dorothy Dandridge lying face down naked um, on the bathroom floor with just a blue scarf on her head. And some sources say she has the cast on her foot. Other sources said there was no cast on her foot. But they said her body is perfumed, like she just got out the shower and maybe perfumed herself, about to get dressed, and something happened, and she died. Reportedly, there were two possible causes of death. The first cause, which was reported by the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office, said that she died of an overdose of Tofranil, which was an antidepressant medicine. The second cause, which was from the Los Angeles Pathology Institute, said that she died from an embolism that she got when she injured her foot. I believe that Dorothy had an accidental overdose. That's just what I believe in my heart. Some people believe that she committed suicide on purpose. I don't believe that. You guys tell me in the comments what you think. Do you think that it was a suicide? Do you think it was an accidental overdose? Or do you think it was the embolism? The date of her death was September 12th, 1965. And that is the tragic, scandalous tale of Miss Dorothy Dandridge. Now, let's get down to the voting. Who are we going to see, guys? Are we going to do Mr. Otis Reddy? Or are we going to do the beautiful Miss Lola Falana? So, you guys, tell me who you want to see next, and I will put that video out as soon as I count the votes. I'll get started on it. Thank you guys so much for watching. This is Ashley with Ashley Says So. Click, like, subscribe, share, do whatever you have to do. You guys have a great night. Wow.